let's get started. Hello, everyone. My name is Alexia Kelly. I'm the Senior Director of Research at Gillings UNC's uh, School of Global Public Health. And I'm here with Dr. Penny Gordon Larson, Professor of Nutrition and the Gillings Associate Dean for Research. And we want to welcome you to our next Building COVID-19 Research Collaborations webinar. Uh, we have more of these webinars in the coming weeks, so please stay tuned for more information about those soon. For a little logistics about today's webinar, I'll be introducing our speakers and they will speak in turn and then we will follow both presentations with a question and answers from the viewers. We ask that you type any questions you have for the presenters into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can do this throughout the presentation. And then following the presentation, I will turn the floor over to Dr. Gordon Larson who will moderate the Q&A session and will read the questions aloud to our presenters. The title of today's talk is Where is SARS-CoV-2 and where does it get and how does it get there? Current and future research on environmental surveillance and transmission. I will now introduce both speakers before their presentation. This is a challenging time for all of us, so we have e asked each of them how they are coping. Dr. Joe Brown will be joining the Department of Environmental Sciences and Engineering in December as an associate professor, and he is currently at Georgia Tech. His family is, his family's COVID-19 coping involves a lot of silly science. For example, they now have several hundred tree frog tadpoles in a very large casserole dish in their kitchen. All the tadpoles are named Dave and they eat mainly sushi nori. Uh, we hope this experiment ends happily for all concerned. When Dr. Brown is finished with his presentation, he will turn the floor over to our second speaker. Dr. Barbara Turpin is a professor and the chair of the Department of Environmental Sciences and Engineering at Gillings. Her family's pandemic vacation involved helping her oldest daughter fix up her 1890 house. It was fun for Barb to have her daughter teach her new things and nice for her to have some company. So with that, I would like to turn the webinar over to Dr. Brown. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much for the introduction. Um, I meant to bring some tadpoles with me here to the office, but in the, in the rush to get out of the house, I neglected to do that. It is bring your tadpoles to work day. Um, so um, thanks everybody uh, for joining uh, by distance. I know this is less than ideal, um, both for speakers and for attendees, but um, we're hoping this, this is useful. I'm gonna cover a little bit of ground as part one of our presentation today, just talking about um, what we know about SARS-CoV-2, which is what I'll call the virus uh, in environmental media. Um, and then we'll talk more about environmental transmission in part two. Um, so the virus that causes COVID-19 is SARS-CoV-2. Uh, all of you will uh, know something about this virus at this point. It's a, in, in sort of biological terms, it's a positive sense single-stranded RNA virus. So it's, it's nucleic acid is RNA and not, and not DNA. Um, how big is it? It's about 10,000 times smaller than a grain of salt. So it's about 50 to 200 nanometers and it has 30,000 bases in its RNA genome. Um, as, as you probably all also know, it has a possible um, zoonotic origin. It's similar uh, genetically to bat coronaviruses. Um, and over on the right, you'll see the, the, uh, the sort of family tree for, uh, corona, for these coronaviruses. It's closely related to SARS-CoV uh, one, which is, you know, also known as just SARS, um, MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome uh, virus, and a host of other ones that have been identified mainly in animals. Um, um, other ones that you may have heard of are the murine coronavirus or MH, um, MHV, the, the murine hepatitis virus. Um, some of these we use as surrogates in, um, in the work that we do on, on this virus uh, because it's thought that their behavior um, under some conditions like persistence in the environment and the effectiveness of treatment processes might be similar in these other surrogates that are very closely related. Uh, they work the same way. Um, so they, it could have originated in bats. We don't know that for sure. It may or may not have had an intermediate host, uh, widely speculated to be pangolins, um, but unknown for sure. And we think it jumped to, to humans sometime in the November, December timeframe uh, in China in 2019. Um, there have been a number of other papers that have come out recently that have um, reported detection of the nucleic acid of this virus in some other countries, even as early as sort of mid-November uh, in places like southern France, um, Spain, and, and Brazil. But those are mostly unconfirmed with clinical data. They're just RNA detections and could be artifacts of, um, of you know, lab, lab mistakes. Um, it's a sort of 
uh, oval to roundish shape. Um, you can see there on the left the, the sort of classic corona, which means crown of the coronavirus um, is, is present. And on the right is a transmission electron uh, micrograph showing uh, the little balls. They, they do differ in size uh, quite a bit in morphology. So how we detect it is uh, mainly via two methods. I'm not gonna talk about the, the so-called diagnostic methods uh, where we're looking for antibodies often, um, although you can do diagnostics with these methods as well, uh, but how we look for them in environmental media and how, uh, and how they're, they're used in research to look at you know, presence of the, of the virus's nucleic acid and viability. Um, so first, RNA, just detecting the RNA sequence that we know to be associated with this particular virus um, through reverse transcriptase PCR and sequencing, and various gene targets are used. So you'll see over on the right, there's a table of some of the different methods that have been recommended by some of the kind of global actors in monitoring for coronavirus. In the U.S., um, the CDC recommends the N, uh, some targets on the N gene, which are N1, N2, and N3. Uh, the sequences are down below. Um, but other, you know, hopefully everybody's got their favorite method for this. Um, so there's some diversity in, in the methods out there for RNA. Um, in terms of culture, we look for, uh, you know, for viable virus uh, by way of demonstration of infection and replication competency in susceptible cells. So here we're looking at um, uh, infection of the virus on uh, mammalian cells. Um, these are uh, typically Vero cells, but there are uh, several cell lines that are being used right now. And you're looking for a cytopathic effect uh, or CPE, which takes about anywhere from two to seven days to manifest, although five to six days is typical. Um, and you're really looking for, you know, three things here. You're looking for, you know, can the virus infect these cells? Uh, is the virus titer amplified um, uh, in the process of infecting those cells, and does it, can it go on to infect new cells, fresh uh, monolayers? And then uh, can we verify that the target that is being amplified there is, is the virus? So uh, we'll often do sequencing or PCR confirmation um, of viable cells. So here you can see on the left an uninfected monolayer of mammalian cells. These are, uh, these are Vera's E6 cells, which derive from kidney epithelial cells of an African green monkey. Um, and then on the right, this is this sort of cytopathic effect, kind of an extreme case of you know, cellular destruction right, of the monolayer uh, of the virus. So that's direct evidence that this thing is, uh, is viable. And then obviously we, we confirm this through other means as well. So how does it get uh, from somebody who's infected to other people? Well, I've got four matrices here. Uh, this is a study of 49 uh, patients. Uh, from China that looked at um, RNA shedding across different bodily fluids, both in mild cases and severe cases, mild on the left and severe on the right. Um, and you can see that, you know, something that's uh, part, you know, partially alarming to me is that, um, you know, people can shed the virus um, many days after uh, illness onset. So you can see on the, on the horizontal axis here that uh, in mild cases uh, for throat swabs, uh, you're seeing, you know, a median of um, 15 days uh, following the onset of illness that infectious, or not infectious, sorry, the RNA of the virus is detectable in that fluid, right? So uh, throat, sputum, um, third, third row is nasal pharyngeal swabs, um, and then feces on the very bottom. Feces are close to my heart, uh, obviously, for reasons that I'll talk about. Um, and the viability of the virus that shed through these various bodily fluids and others, you know, urine, semen, um, uh, is less well characterized outside of a person. Although if you're actively shedding the virus, it's presumed that it's, it was recently at least um, um, uh, viable. Uh, in feces and in fecal waste, uh, we now know that in the intestinal epithelium uh, supports replication of the virus. So the virus can infect your um, intestinal cells and, um, and productively reproduce. Uh, that's been demonstrated. And by the way, for most of the points that I'm making in this presentation, you'll see uh, the paper references uh, somewhere nearby the point that I'm making. Um, viable virus has been isolated from feces. Um, uh, the RNA has been detected in wastewaters from several countries at titers up to about 10 to the fifth per mil copies. Um, but no infectious um, virus has been uh, recovered from other untreated or treated wastewater. So, 
Um, so although it's present there and, and looks like it's very persistent um, in, in sort of fecal waste and, and wastewater um, in, in high titers, it's um, not likely to be, to be viable. Um, over on the right here, you can see this is another stu longitudinal study of um, shedding of viral uh, RNA from uh, patients uh, who are known to be infected. And the, the red, I can't actually see my own legend, the red are throat swabs. Uh, that are positive for the RNA, and the sort of yellow is uh, fecal samples that are positive for the RNA. So, so we know that um, shedding of the RNA from feces can persist for even longer than through, um, through throat swabs. I think it's also worth reflecting on this number, 10 to the fifth per mil, that's exceedingly high. You have to keep in mind that in wastewater, it is maybe 1% fecal waste. It's very dilute. So uh, seeing those very, very high numbers uh, in wastewater from cities um, and communities where uh, there's widespread infection is, is quite striking, but it makes it easy to find for us. Um, so wastewater surveillance is something that uh, you may have heard a lot about. We're doing a lot of that in my lab and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the early goal with wastewater surveillance was to supplement um, uh, clinical surveillance to estimate, to actually, um, De derived methods for estimating community prevalence. That was, uh, that proved to be uh, quickly um, demonstrated to be not that feasible because there's a lot of uncertainty, both in the shedding of the virus, its persistence uh, after it leaves the host uh, and other things. Uh, we now think of it uh, really in, in three applications. Firstly, and maybe most importantly, is advanced warning of infections. So maybe four to, day four to seven days um, before you see a spike in clinical cases, you will, you will see a spike in the a viral RNA in the wastewater from wherever, whatever community is experiencing the spike. Um, this was shown most dramatically in a preprint from Jordan Peccia's group at Yale on the right. You'll see there um, viral RNA per mil of wastewater uh, and also clinical cases. This is from New Haven wastewater. Um, and you see this nice smooth graph that looks like this is a very reliable indicator of advanced warning. Um, by the way, they've since revised the preprint print, and what you see on the right is what they have now, which is the non-smooth data, which to me looks a lot um, uh, more complex, right? There could be a lot of noise in this signal as well. Um, and, and, um, but it, it looks like it's a pretty robust indicator uh, from four to seven days in advance, and this has been demonstrated across a lot of places. Uh, we, we also think that um, viral RNA signals in wastewater can give us uh, some indication of the directionality of cases in that particular, what we'll call a sewer shed. Um, and also we can roll this out in places where uh, clinical surveillance is limited, and that's almost everywhere right now, including in places that are maybe uh, harder to reach or uh, underrepresented in clinical testing. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff on methods for this. Um, I'll just point you to one website, the, uh, the WBE Collaborative, uh, which is, was started by a former postdoc of mine. Uh, we have an NSF Rapid to do Atlanta wastewater surveillance. So we're now um, uh, mapping um, viral RNA from four different plants. We've been sampling since Mar uh, mid-March, which is pretty soon after the first clinical cases popped up in Atlanta. And we're covering a population of almost 2 million people um, through four, these four plants. And then doing more intensive sampling at a couple of uh, plants in Gwinnett County, which is kind of um, suburban Atlanta. So the data are not online. We're sort of working with our partners to, to try to make that happen quickly. So I'm not going to show you any data from that, just to say that it's, it's coming out very soon. And you can follow me on Twitter if you want. Um, and have, and that, that's where I'll be making a lot of noise about this when it comes out. By the way, this is another um, article in the popular press that I think is a really great description of the utility of, of looking at uh, wastewater for viral RNA, um, and you might be interested in it. I think the other thing that, that, um, that this can do in, in terms of a tool is really focus in on small scale um, uh, types of um, catchments, because really, I'm sure, I mean, we see a lot of, um, uh, of the virus RNA in wastewater from a big city, but that tells us a lot less than if you were to sample from the outflow from a dorm on the UNC campus, for example. You know, that using a smaller scale enables you to maybe um, more finely tune your, um, your scope of testing so you can find uh, cases that have been missed by other means. 
So in terms of environmental persistence, once it gets out there, um, it's pretty stable across, um, uh, across a lot of different surfaces. This is a paper uh, by Comp et al, uh, which has been cited 1200 times since it was published about six weeks ago. Um, that is a review of uh, the virus, but mainly surrogates to the virus. And you'll see that in the second column there uh, and looks at uh, some of the conditions and the, and the persistent time. So there've been a couple of examples of surrogates that have lasted up to nine days but mainly we're talking about 24 to 72 hours, um, maybe a little longer for persistence on surfaces. Um, aerosols, about three hours. Um, we'll cover that a little bit in the next slide. Uh, and water and wastewater, really kind of unknown, but presumed pretty limited compared um, uh, based on studies in surrogates on persistence. Um, and here I'm talking about viable virus, not the RNA, which is far more uh, persistent. Um, this study um, uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, which reported the, the persistence of the virus in aerosols, concluded it was about a three hour um, persistence for, um, for the virus in aerosols. And they also looked at a number of surfaces. Uh, you can see the, um, the titer of the virus um, going down from about 10 to the four to, to 10 to the third in about, a, in about three hours. Um, and this is one of the things that, you know, the people who are um, speculating about and doing science on um, the hypothesis of airborne transmission or sort of pointing to this as a key data point in that analysis for reasons that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, disinfection, it's, you know, this virus is readily inactivated via many common disinfectants, which is good news. Um, it's a lot less uh, environmentally persistent um, in unfavorable uh, conditions compared to unenveloped viruses. It's temperature sensitive, it's oxidant sensitive. Um, it's quickly inactivated across most of our um, uh, disinfection uh, processes that we use, which is great. Um, in terms of transmission, so I want to just briefly talk about a little bit of this and then and I'll pass to, to Barb. Um, it's, it's basic reproduction number. Those of you who study epi, um, the R sort of R naught is thought to be in the two to two and a half range. Estimates range from a 1.4 to 3.9, occasionally higher or lower. Um, and um, this puts it in the same ballpark as influenza virus, which has a you know, R naught of two to two and a half. Um, and that's really a, a measure of how many, how many people an infected person is passing the uh, virus to in each successive stage, uh, as you can see on the right. Um, and so cl close contact and droplets are thought to dominate from the existing epi evidence. Um, and a few lines of evidence that have been used to to back that up are, uh, for example, the, the studies are, uh, that have emerged from China and the outbreak there around the majority of, of cases um, being confined to those living in close contact. Um, also, a number of other studies have been pointed to uh, suggesting that healthcare workers that uh, even without maintaining adequate PPE always, but maintaining distance are not at greater risk um, when in, you know, reasonably close but not within six feet contact of those uh, with the virus. Uh, and there have been some other case studies, um, uh, one being um, you know, uh, a, a, a flight, a 15 hour flight from China to Toronto. Thankfully the plane landed in Toronto and not in the US. So they were able to follow, they actually spent the time following the people who landed there and showed um, you know, nobody else getting the virus despite the fact that there was an index case on, on the plane. Um, but these are also in places where the air exchange rates are probably on the high side. Um, other scenarios are very common. Um, so um, uh, acquiring the virus, is a virus outside of the healthcare setting, acquiring the virus uh, out there in the environment just in regular uh, interactions with people um, is very common. So there's um, a great deal of research going into understanding those kinds of settings and understanding whether the virus, um, you know, could be um, transmitted um, and that that could be a relatively important um, uh, transmission pathway in some, under some conditions, um, that is to say aerosols. So uh, sort of framing some of the work that, that we're doing here at, at UNC is you know, this need to better understand transmission across this range of settings. And, and our hypothesis is that mechanistic models can help with this. And by mechanistic, I mean, as a complement to traditional epi methods, um, looking at 
the concentrations of viable virus um, across different environmental media. And in this case, you know, we're most interested in aerosols. Um, and looking at, um, you know, uh, looking at where and when the virus is and in what concentrations, uh, looking at possibilities of exposure um, to the virus, and then uh, coupling that with you know, what we think we can um, uh, derive around, you know, dose response relationships to estimate, you know, potential for infection risk. So this is something we do in, in the water sciences uh, a great deal, where we, where we use so-called quantitative microbial risk assessment to look at you know, the potential for different infectious agents to be present in you know, water and wastewater and estimating in, infection risk based on those things. So we're using some similar methods, um, but the, the main questions that, that I have uh, and really the kind of the main unknowns here um, as a backdrop for a lot of our work is you know, which, which routes can, can viable virus be transmitted and what densities? So um, Barb will talk about a lot of the science as to why we think you know, absolutely the airborne transmission can happen, but whether it's an important pathway of transmission is another question and we need to you know, compare it to the other pathways and we, we need to get to the bottom of that. And also um, this question around dose response. So we don't have a dose response model for this virus yet, um, but um, we do for some other coronaviruses, but it's still, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of work needs to go into understanding this, how we, how we take a concentration that's maybe present in the air, even if we know it's viable and, and you know, uh, say something about what the risk is, what, what the risk means compared to other transmission pathways. So I think I'm out of time, so I'll just uh, end there and say, uh, there's an example of, of such a mechanistic model that's online. There are a couple of links here. Um, I'll, I'll make sure that these slides stay available for, uh, for everybody who's interested in maybe checking this out. Um, and I think Barb will also kind of walk us through um, what this might look like. So with that, I'll stop talking and I'll have, be happy to take your questions after, after Barb finishes. Joe, if you unshare, then I can share. Oh, there we go. All right, so um, I'm an aerosol scientist and I don't know, oh, I was gonna say, I don't know about anything that's alive, but that's okay, since viruses aren't alive, I can work on viruses. And I'm going to focus on droplets and aerosols, which are really kind of the same thing. Um, so aerosols are liquid or solid particles that are suspended in air or any other gas. And droplets are really big aerosols, so big that it's hard for them to remain in the air. So the most common example for you know, the common person is rain droplets, which are about 100 microns and cloud droplets, which you know, vary in size, but something like 20 microns in diameter. Um, okay, so size matters in a couple of really big ways. First of all, the size of the particles, airborne particles determine their uh, lifetime in the atmosphere or in the indoor environment. And it also determines uh, when you inhale them, where do they end up? Um, the, as Joe mentioned, the um, uh, CoV-2 is about 100 or 200 uh, mic uh, uh, nanometers in diameter, that's 0.1 or 0.2 microns. And in the air, those viruses will be surrounded by respiratory fluids. So maybe you'll have one, two, or three, who knows how many viruses in, a, in an aerosol particle or in a droplet. This is some very nice work by Lydia Morosky, Moroska, and she um, uh, put a person in a wind tunnel, basically, and um, measured, um, counted the particles as a function of particle size, um, when they were breathing, speaking, or singing, and coughing. And um, she did this with many people, and so she got a particle size distribution is what you're seeing here. And what you find is that when you cough, and her measurements didn't measure the droplet mode here at 100, around 100 microns. But when you cough or speak or sing or breathe, 
or sneeze, you produce um, aerosols. And most of those aerosol particles are around in this mode here that's about 0.8 microns in diameter. Um, when you cough or sneeze, you're also producing some 100 micron droplets. Um, and it's about, for coughing, it's about 100 times more submicron particles than large droplets. Um, speaking, singing, and breathing, it's really mostly, almost all submicron uh, particles. And these particles are made because the air, you know, so I'm talking right now, and while I'm talking, the air is coming up through um, my airways, and it's shearing off uh, bits of fluid and creating uh, particles from those expiratory fluids. This plot shows um, really concentration here is really a surrogate for the emission rate of, of aerosol particles, submicron particles, and with different activities. So um, what I learned from this plot is that when you say out loud, ah, you produce, that means, you know, singing or vocalizing, um, you produce more particles higher emission rate than coughing or whispering awe ah, or counting one, two, three, four, five, six, or whispering one, two, three, four, five, six, or breathing. <clears throat> All right, so it's, it's possible that infected people could be emitting viable CoV-2 containing aerosol all the time. We know that CoV-2 is present in the respiratory tract. Um, uh, hospitalized SARS patients were known to emit viable aerosolized virus that had been measured. And now there have been two measurements of um, CoV-2 in aerosol in hospital, in, um, the, in the patients, in hospital rooms with infected patients. So that's not very many samples, right? It's actually quite difficult to collect, gently collect this aerosol so as to maintain its viability. And then you've got to have, a, you know, there are a limited number of places that can actually um, culture it and do those measurements. Uh, so anyway, it's, it has been measured in a very small number of uh, rooms in hospitals with infection, infectious patients. Um, and uh, let's see, Joe showed this already about the viability of the aerosolized virus. So the point is that we know that it maintains its viability for a decent amount of time, one to three hours um, in aerosol. So that's an important point. <clears throat> So I wanted to point out that one of the real uh, limitations in terms of determining whether and to what extent uh, CoV-2 is present in aerosols, one of the real limitations is the ability to measure it in ambient air. And so this is a really nice sampler. Um, one of the two measurements that has already been made uh, in the hospital was made using this sampler. It's called a biospot. And what it does is um, when the aerosol particles come into the biospot and they're still in the air, um, they're grown by water condensation. So water condenses on those particles and it makes them much bigger. And when the particles are much bigger, they're easier to impact um, and remove. So at the bottom of the sampler then, the, the, part, the air stream takes a sharp turn and it's going at a high enough velocity that the particles, those large, now they're large droplets instead of small aerosol particles, um, they keep going straight and they impact on a little bit of water or saline solution or um, um, you know, something, some nice solution for collecting and maintaining the viability of the virus. So we have one of these samplers. There are not very many. There's, it's a prototype. There are not very many that have been made. 
And um, our plan then is to take this sampler to places where, um, not to hospitals, but to places where people hang out, where we think it's more likely that we'll find airborne um, viable virus so that, and I'll explain below, but that would be places that have um, low air, lower air exchange rates, that are likely to have infected patients, and, um, and where it would matter, right? Where people spend a significant amount of time. Uh, and we also have planned to do some other experiments. So this is, shows our team right here. Um, uh, we have both aerosol scientists, indoor air experts, microbiologists, and Ralph Barrick is on board with his BL3 lab um, to do the um, culturing of the COVID-2. <clears throat> we also have quite a bit of experience. Jason Surratt has um, done lots of work in, in laboratory environments to um, to study what happens to aerosols when you um, when they're processed in the environment. So we can take, for example, a non-infectious surrogate coronavirus and ge generate aerosols of known size and then expose those to various um, insults like ozone, like OH radicals and UV and see what would happen to those aerosols, especially in the outdoor environment and can those experiments to um, help us to understand how we could um, inactivate them faster in uh, indoor environments. So this just shows this, the sampler, the BioSpot, has a really high collection efficiency for collecting uh, fine particles and, um, and it's gentle. And so that's nice for the virus. Okay, size is really important. So here's where you'll find out I'm really an aerosol scientist and an engineer. If you um, solve the mass, the force balance, you can find the terminal settling velocity of a particle. So the terminal settling velocity is determined by the, um, uh, the gravitational force, uh, setting the gravitational force equal to the drag force. And you can see the settling velocity of a particle in the air is a strong function of the particle diameter. And so if a particle, <laughs> I can't really do this, but if, I, if I'm holding a particle about a meter and a half above the ground and I let go, for a hundred micron droplet, it's gonna take less than a minute to fall to the ground, right? So that's the way they always say, stay six feet away, because if droplets come out of somebody's mouth and they have a viable virus, those droplets are gonna fall fast. <clears throat> For a 0.8 micron particle, it, it would take 14 hours to fall to the ground. And in fact, all aerosol scientists know that outdoors, um, a fine submicron aerosol remains in the atmosphere for one or two weeks. In an indoor environment, the air in the, in the room or in your house, in the building, is exchanged with outdoor air much faster than that. And so, um, you know, even though aerosols stay, submicron aerosols stay in the air for one or two weeks, it doesn't mean they stay in your house that long. But size, this is where I'm just trying to explain that the size of the particle really matters because it tells you how far that particle can go and uh, how long it will be in your environment. All right, so from there you can really easily do um, a mass balance on um, a room or a, or a home, let's say. And so my home is, uh, was built about 20 years ago. We've done some indoor air experiments on my home. I know the air exchange rate is about 0.5 per hour. And what, what that means is about every two hours, um, the air in my house, on most of the air in my house ex is exchanged with clean air from outdoors. And so the dirty air in my house leaves and the clean air comes in on a time scale of about once every two hours. 
if you do the the mass balance here um, that says that the 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 accumulation or depletion of number of virus uh, viruses per time in the air in my house or in a building depends on um, the number per time coming in from outdoors, we'll just assume it's zero, plus the emission of virus from any infected people, minus losses, okay? And here the losses are deposition to surfaces. And this, we know this number, but it's really small. It's about 0.1 per hour. Um, air exchange rate, so loss with um, air that leaves the building, and then the inactivation of the virus. And so um, if you solve this in a steady state case, then here are the dependencies. Um, and so what you find is that um, the air exchange rate really matters and the source strength really matters. And these other things we know pretty well. Um, uh, we know the deposition rate is small, we can measure the the volume of the room, we can measure their air exchange rate. We have some, some idea about what the, um, uh, the inactivation rate is. And, um, okay, so what I wanted to point out here especially is that um, the air exchange rates in buildings can also be known, but they vary a lot. So in a lot of homes, the air exchange rates are pretty low. Um, um, whereas in hospitals, the air exchange rates are high. And um, in classrooms, depending on if they have forced air or if they're old and they just have natural ventilation, they can vary quite a bit. Um, whether, my, my other point here is that whether you're in, if someone is in close proximity, they're exposed both to higher concentrations of droplets and to higher concentrations of submicron aerosols. While I'm talking, there's a plume of particles in front of my mouth, um, you know, out here, that I'm pr constantly producing this plume of particles. And so the concentration in front of me is substantially higher than the concentration across the room. That plume is rapidly mixed with all the air in the room. And so there, it, there are some aerosol particles. If you're farther from me, you're exposed to that um, mix of particles. And that's really what this steady state concentration is um, predicting. And that, you know, across the room, then the concentration is lower. All right. So, we know that if, you st if you're within six feet, you're exposed to both a higher droplet concentration and a higher aerosol concentration. But if airborne transmission is really important, is really important, then even if you stay long, farther away than six feet, we know that your, the concentration you're exposed to will be much lower, much lower, but your dose will continue to increase the longer you stand there. So the dose, if you know the concentration here, oops, you know the concentration here depends on the emission rate, which depends, you know, a lot on whether the infected person is wearing a mask. And it depends on the air exchange rate here. The dose depends on the concentration, the inhalation rate of the person, and the exposure time, how long that person is in that environment. And then what we really don't know is what's the dose response. Um, we don't know very much about the emission rate of viable virus, and we don't know very much about how much virus do you need to inhale to make you sick. Um, really, the question is, um, we know that, um, we think we know that most people who get sick, get sick because they're in close proximity. And that could be either because of droplets or aerosols. The question is, if you did an experiment, which we can't do because it sounds unethical to me,
But if we put some infected people over on one side of the room and non-infected people over on the other side of the room, and you just wait, um, would these people become infected and how long would it take, right? And that's the aerosol question. There are a, a few cases, I'm gonna have to wrap it up pretty soon, but there are a few cases that suggest aerosol spread. Um, there are several cases of uh, choirs uh, where somebody was singing in a room. So here's one where they've done a really nice write-up. They believe there was one index case and 52 of the 61 people who were in the room singing got infected. Now singing, as I told you, is a really good way to make aerosol. And uh, so what these authors did, oh, um, this was in Washington state. So it was already known that there was community spread of the virus. And so the choir director told everyone to take quite a few precautions. You know, don't come if you're sick, avoid contact. They, they worked hard to prevent, um, you know, touching and things like that. But still, quite a, many, almost all the people became sick, 85% or something. So the authors sort of back calculated, knowing the, um, the probability of infection, knowing the air exchange rate, the building volume. If you work backwards, you can estimate the emission rate of the virus um, from that event. And they estimated a little under 1,000 quanta per hour um, for singing. And this is not out of, uh, out of bounds of what was predicted by Bonanno, who just used the sputum, um, amounts in the sputum to predict um, the emission rate. Um, this is a dinner in China where this family came from Wuhan and these other two families came from somewhere else. Um, they believe that this purple person was the infected one. They all showed up at different times and so there's no indication from quizzing the people that they were in contact. Um, but this, and the waiters didn't become infected. Um, but the arrows show the airflow, and these different segments of the restaurant have different, very different um, flows, flow patterns. And so um, what they found is all the red people here seem to become infected from this index person. And um, since many of them are further than six feet away, they posited that that was um, aerosol spread. Okay, so these um, very rough estimates of emission rates for um, COVID-2 of somewhere around 300, you know, probably in a sense, 30 for being at rest and uh, up to a thousand perhaps are somewhere in between the emission rates for influenza and for measles. So that sort of makes sense. It, there isn't any evidence that I know of that suggests that um, COVID-2 is spread through the air as easily as smallpox or measles. You know, there are cases for smallpox and measles where the, it's believed that it was airborne spread across floors and rooms in a hospital, for example. And I don't think anybody's seen that. Um, and then... There are some really nice um, plots that came out of the Skagit Valley Corral case that help you see um, uh, what it, uh, how different things matter. For example, in their case, they had an air exchange rate of about one per hour, about 85% of the people got sick. Um, but if they had increased the air exchange rate or if they'd had an air exchange rate as high as a hospital, the probability of infection would have gone way down. And if you decrease from two and a half hours of time together, 
to a half hour of time together, the probability of infection goes way down. And if the person wore a mask, the probability of infection would have gone down by about a factor of 10 also. So why does it matter? It's really clear um, that wearing a mask, even when you're more than six feet apart, is a really good idea because it reduces the emission rate. Um, if people maintain distance, of course, then that means there are fewer people that might be sick in the same room and it reduces the potential total source. Um, if aerosol transmission is important, then you don't want to linger in an environment because the longer you stay, even if you're further than six feet away, the more likely you'll be uh, infected. And of course, outdoors is safer than indoors because you're mixing the virus with a much larger volume of air. So we don't really know. It, it seems to me like we really need to make measurements in places where there are people, where people hanging out. Um, not just measurements of the RNA, but of the viable virus. <clears throat> and we don't really know for sure if aerosol transmission is more important than droplets. We, we think being in close proximity is, is something we don't want to be doing. Um, but if aerosol transmission is important, then the CDC definition of who's exposed and who needs to get tested would, should change. Because currently it says um, less than 15 minutes within six feet. And so if you work with someone in the same room for eight hours, but you stay six feet apart, then they wouldn't recommend uh, testing or isolation. Um, and my final piece of advice is safe singing for the shower. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Barb and, and Joe. That was really fantastic, really interesting. So um, the first question, uh, and we only so far have one question in the Q&A, so welcoming all of the audience participants to, um, to submit questions if they have them. Um, but one question really combines both of your um, talks, and that relates to monitoring on UNC campus. And I, know, I don't know that Joan knows um, much about our campus per se yet, but um, in terms of sewage from individual dorms, um, and then, you know, would you potentially do air monitoring in, you know, do a study that you could combine the air and sewage monitoring? Ooh, I'm, I was muted. Those are good questions. I'll start with the with the sewage thing, and, and I am pretty aware of the UNC campus. I, I did my PhD here. Oh, uh, good. Well, 12 years ago, so 13 years ago, so it's great to be back. Um, so what we're doing right now, and this sort of relates to my comments about the utility of measuring at smaller scales, um, what we're doing right now in Atlanta on the Georgia Tech campus is uh, rolling out a plan to monitor individual dorms and high-use buildings. Um, most buildings have, a, have a, a sewer clean out that you can sample from. And there's some problems with doing this because you don't really, you don't usually have really high flows. So the, so the waste may not be well mixed. It may not, it may be difficult to get representative samples across these smaller scales, but uh, we think this is going to be a great supplement to our current uh, testing plans on, on that campus. And I think such a system would be, um, you know, potentially highly useful here at UNC for similar reasons. That's great. I just would I'm not aware of any current plans to do that, however. But I'm not either, right? I know that Rachel Noble and Jill Stewart have a wastewater uh, project in North Carolina, but uh, I don't think it involves dorms. Okay, so um, a question about um, aerosol production from exercising, how that looks in comparison to singing, talking, breathing. Oh yes, I I haven't seen that. I think we should. I think that should be done. Um, we could do that. I I don't know. Lydia could probably do that faster. Um, more more Oscar. Certainly, we already built, built the setup. Um, It'd be really interesting to look at that in the context of gyms, in mm -hmm. places where people are doing a lot of exercising. I mean, it. You know, the when you are when you're speaking and more actively, you emit more particles. 
So, you know, I think it's pretty clear that if you're breathing and running, you're breathing hard, you're going to emit more particles than if you're just breathing at rest. The question is, is it as many as singing? I don't know the answer. But I, I, I know that when I'm, I, I think that if you're running, you know, some people run in a treadmill inside, that's definitely more dangerous. I'm not going to a gym anytime soon is what I'm saying. Um, if you're running outside on the trail, um, I wouldn't be running right behind somebody else who's running, right? Because, you know, you're, you're still, and just imagine the plume of particles, it's going to follow their air, right? So they're running away from the air they just breathed and you're running into it. So that's gonna be a place where the concentration is gonna be higher if they're not wearing a mask. The, 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 the image that has been really helpful for me in that context is that has been suggested by a number of aerosol scientists is imagining that person smoking a cigarette, which produces aerosols. If you're, if you're kind of close enough for that to be annoying to you, that means you're breathing in a lot of what they're producing in their ex exhalations, right? So we can't see we can't see it in the same way we can see smoke, but I think it's a it's a good sort of visual indicator. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, what would your recommendation be for elementary school children who don't change classrooms as often as the middle and high schoolers, but um, you know, and they're eating lunch in the room, so they're basically you know kind of in one in one space for a long time. Yeah, eating and drinking inside are really kind of a problem, aren't they? Um, because you can do it with a mask on, right? And, um, you know, um, it, it would be much, a much better idea if they can eat, if they can go outside. Yeah. Um, there have been some um, conversation about toilet flushing. And so what are, what are the concerns about aerosols there? Well, like I say, I think um, we've, we've, we've detected live virus or viable virus, infectious virus in feces from people who are infected. We've never detected it in, in wastewater. Um, it's widely thought that it becomes rapidly inactivated and that we don't shed very much in the way of infectious virus um, in fecal waste. Uh, however, we do shed a lot of the RNA, as you've seen, and we've shed it for a long period of time. So. I'm not that, that concerned about um, aerosolization of virus from toilet flushing. We know that toilet flushing does lead to the creation of, um, of, you know, this, the, of aerosols that can contain enteric bacteria, viruses, protozoans, uh, anything that's in your feces. Um, and that that forms a plume that can settle over all the surfaces in the bathroom, including your toothbrush. So sweet dreams. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it's a terrifying prospect, but in terms of an exposure pathway specifically for COVID-19, I'm not that concerned about it. I do think it's always best practice to close the lid before we flush. And that these institutional potties that don't have lids are an abomination. So we need to put lids on all of them. <laughs> Great, so uh, we have a couple of questions about AC. So um, first um, about filtration, which I assume HEPA filters is you know what you would say, but then what about, the um, spread within HVAC systems in different rooms of the same building? You know, I'm not as worried about that. Um, I, um, what we can say about air conditioning in general, um, there have been quite a few times when there's a major air pollution event, for example, um, wildfires where the advice from the local public health uh, agencies is really good advice, um, which is, you know, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and for the last five years or so, every time I go home in the summer, there's a, a big wildfire and it's smoky and it interferes with my ability to see the mountains and things like that. But what, what they tell people is turn on your air conditioner, right? And that's good advice because the air conditioning system um, really reduces the, um, it's a big loss for particles. So it reduces the number of particles in the air when you run your air conditioner. 
I hate to tell people that because it also is a positive climate feedback, which means it makes the climate worse when you run your air conditioner. Um, but it does remove particles. And if you don't forget to change the AC filter, that's helpful. If you buy an AC filter that has a higher MERV rating, removes uh, particles with a, a higher removal efficiency, then that's, that's also helpful. Um, but I don't think there's any evidence currently that um, the virus lives in the AC or uh, moves through the AC to different rooms and infect people in different parts of the building. Okay, great. Um, we're sort of winding down, so I'm gonna, I will see if we can, how many more questions. This might be the last question. Um, there was a recent study at Duke that showed that different types of mask um, material porosity had different efficacy and emission rate. And so have you seen enough of those patterns personally, either of you to make firm recommendation of correct face covering? Uh, so the way the masks work best is that, you know, I, I mentioned that the particles produced while I'm talking are coming rapidly out of my mouth, mouth right? And because they're moving quickly, um, even though the air is trying to go around the cracks, around and through the cracks in my mouth and around the edges of, of, of the mask, um, those particles, the air might turn and the particles will keep going and they'll splat on the material or on a fiber as the air tries to go through. Um, and so the masks are, that's why they keep telling you the masks are more effective if everyone wears them because we don't know who's infected and what we need is the infected person or people to be wearing them, right? Once the particles are out in the room, they just move with the airstream, you know? And um, it's hard to, much harder to get them out of the air when they're just floating around in the room. Um, so effective masks, you can protect yourself better from having particles come into your mouth and nose. If your mask fits better around your face. And so that means probably wearing a softer, you know, if you're gonna make your mask so you can keep reusing it, use a softer fabric that will fit your face better, right? And not have gaps. Um, uh, and then there's a trade-off between having a material that, um, that uh, removes the particles better versus having material that produces so much resistance that it's not comfortable and you take it off, right? Mm -hmm. So I actually, in the very bottom of my slides, have some um, information about uh, materials for homemade masks. Um, and they're all comparing them really to the surgical mask, which is pretty good. So, Okay, that's great. And um, we will have uh, the, we'll post this slide. So if anybody wants to catch up with any of that material, um, uh, we'll have the video up at, um, at some point in the near future. But this has been fantastic. You got so many questions that we weren't able to answer. So just know that people are really enthusiastic about your topics and your talks today. And um, it was really great to, um, to hear you. And um, we really appreciate it. So thanks everyone for attending and uh, stay tuned for our next uh, webinar in, in the coming weeks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye. -bye. Bye. Penny, if we save the Q&A, we can answer some of those later. Yeah, that would be great. I think Alexia, um,